All right, guys, I got a special treat for you today. I actually was able to track down Mr. Bill Geisley here. He's kind of the trigger wizard uh, these days. He's kind of known for coming out with all kind of awesome trigger designs. Bill, what got you into doing this kind of thing? I know, you know, we were kind of talking last year at SHOT Show, but um, dealing with uh, how you got into this business is kind of an interesting story in its own, own right. Well, I was working in the railway industry as a mechanical engineer and I designed track fasteners. And all day long I ran a design department that worked with castings and forgings. And at the same time I was shooting a high power rifle. Sure. And I'm a distinguished rifleman, but to get there was really difficult. One of the main things that really hurt me was not having a real good trigger at that time for the AR-15. So I decided to design one. And it was something I did all day long, you know, working with 3D CAD and producing new products. Sure. So I designed a trigger in 2004, the beginning of 2004, took it to Camp Perry that summer, and things took off from there. So one of those deals where you go to Camp Perry and you go and you, you go down the line and you go, hey man, what you using? Check this out, give them your trigger, so. Well, it was funny, I, I, I was actually squatted with an AMU shooter, uh, Lance DeMent, and I showed him my trigger and he said, hey, you know what, that's really nice. Why don't you go over to the AMU truck there and show Mr. Clark, Gene Clark's their head armor. And I showed Mr. Clark, he's like, that's a nice trigger. And the first words out of his mouth were, what hammer spring does it use? Because just about every AR-15 trigger on the market uses a soft hammer spring. It's kind of like something people don't like to say. And Mr. Clark told me that they'd done extensive testing on the AR-15 triggers. And when you have a soft hammer spring, groups open up. They're still round, but they get bigger. And as soon as I told him, look, it's our version of the M16A1 hammer spring, he was like, great. Because if it doesn't have a full power hammer spring, we won't use it. Okay, so you, you want that combat reliability. You want something that not only is a good match grade trigger, that feels good in hand, everything like that, and does what it's supposed to do, but you want the combat reliability of a military trigger. Exactly. See, if you don't have sufficient hammer spring torque, first thing that happens is you have inconsistent primer ignition. From that inconsistent primer ignition, you get poor accuracy, but then you also get increased lock time. And a lot of people don't really see this. All they know is they put a cartridge trigger in their gun, they think they're doing great, it's easy. Hey, I put this thing in. Yeah. But what happens is they make their gun less accurate. That's a proven fact. Well, yeah, guys, the thing about lock time, you have to remember, lock time is the time from when you squeeze the trigger and that firing pin is released to the time that that primer actually ignites and fires. and that period of time can allow for a period of inconsistency both in form and let's just face it you know when things are moving you're moving in some minute form so by having a, a shorter lock time you're actually allowing the, the fact that your mind wants you to shoot the gun to the fact that the gun's going to do what you want it to do in the shorter amount of time gives you a much more consistent result you know in the beginning when I first sold my national Spats high speed to the high power community First thing out of people's mouth is, I could feel this lock time, I could feel the difference. So my offhand has improved. I've gained 12 points in my offhand, which is huge in the high power community. Now, I don't hear too much of those comments anymore because just about everybody uses our triggers to be apparent. Sure. For the last several years, just about every winner in the service rifle and match rifle category who use an AR-15 M4 carbine M16 based weapon use the guys to trigger. Well, a lot of your guys are, uh, well, a lot of our guys, let's just say, uh, from our side of the pond, are taking your triggers into combat. Oh, yeah. They from, use them in combat. From, from the high speed, we received a call one day from a special operations customer, and they asked us to make a match grade combat trigger. From that trigger came our SSF, Super Select Fire. And it's very gratifying. Now, just recently there was a terrorist attack in Africa. And as I look through the, vi the photographs of the uh, soldiers responding to it, there are two guys in there, and I can see that their weapons have our SSF, they also have our HK Mark I rail, and one gentleman is sporting an ALT flared bag ball on his Glock. So it's very gratifying to see our stuff on the cutting edge every day. I bet that feels good. It does, very much so. You know, knowing that you're going from the competition circuit to the combat, 
arena because that's really, you know, the crucible that things are developed by when it comes to what soldiers end up using in the field. A lot of it comes from the competition circuit because if you give your gear to a competitor and they can break it, then that tells you what you need to do to make it better because if a competitor can't break it, nobody can. Exactly. Like our high-speed trigger. It, in 2005, Army Marksmanship Unit ordered six of these triggers. And they didn't use them initially in their competition guns. But what they did is they made a proof of concept, proof of concept, SASS, the SAS. The first one was requested from the AMU because AMU is like an R&D type unit also. Not only do they do market chip, sure. but they do research and development for the United States Army. Sure. And the infantry board at Fort Benning wanted to look into the concept of semi-automatic sniper rifle. That we know it as the M110. There's also the M110K. Oh, but yeah. The first six were built by the AMU on an AR-10 chassis using the Geisley high-speed national match. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, you know, not only triggers now. I've, I've, you know, seen that you've got a lot of awesome things like uh, Joe over here is holding the uh, scope mount that you've got. And yep. You mentioned the flare magwell, but I guess first we'll start with uh, what you've got here. Yep. So, Like, like many of our things, they come out of a military requirement. At Geisley's Unique, we're a vertically integrated company. We have everything other than the hot metal work under one roof. So because we have a cutting edge engineering department, we can take a concept, design it, print it in a plastic 3D printer, prove it out, go back, do the iterative design process. So you gotta remember, as human beings, we use iteration, making small changes to improve ourselves. We don't speak things into existence like God does. And I am Fundamentally, I believe in the iterative design process. We go back and forth, proving it out, making sure it's right. Then it gets ported over into our R&D department, and they take it and they make a metal concept model out of it. Cool. Then it goes into production. And we had a military customer come to us this year, earlier this year, and say, we need a better scope mount. The return to zero on our scope mount is not good enough. Can you make one better? We responded with this right here. Guys, the super precision mount. This mount is machined from a solid block, four and a half pound block of 7075 T6 aluminum. It's machined on a five axis milling machine. Five axis means that not only can you turn the part like this, but you can also swing it up. So you can get to basically all sides of it so the part is made in one setup. You're not taking it, moving it from this machine, moving it to that machine, and especially, you're not taking multiple pieces and trying to screw or glue them together. Sure. So what we found is this mount, when tested by the United States military, by one of their laboratories, the maximum return to zero deviation is 0 0.05 milliradians. That's 0.18 of an inch at 100 yards. That is the maximum that they've seen. We've tested it ourselves with a special laser that was manufactured by DE Myers Force that simulates a scope. High power, very small dot. At 100 yards, you could remove this from the gun, put it back on, no torque needed. And this will return to where at 100 yards, you cannot see where that laser has moved on the target. So you can't really have a discernible difference by the naked eye or anything at exactly. all. Exactly. We've, we've got customers telling us that they could put this mount on, not tighten it, have a fellow hold his finger on that and they'll be within a minute of angle at 100 yards. That's how good this returns to zero. You'll notice that each scope cap has a serial number. Each scope is uniquely serialized and each cap is serialized to the base. This is because as one piece, we make this as one piece and then line bore it through the center, from one cap to the other. Sure. And then split it with a jeweler saw. Everything is exactly in line and when you put your scope into it and clamp it up, it's not being twisted. Well, yeah, I mean, from the world of machining work, let's just say if you're a machinist and you're doing one-off stuff for a customer, or let's just say you're doing one-off stuff for yourself, uh, personally, as your home gunsmith or whatever, you, you know from that experience that anytime you take something out of your milling machine or your lathe and you have to re-indicate it, it's still not gonna be this. I mean, it might be somewhat close, but having that five axis CNC machine that's making that thing, you know, if that workpiece never is removed from the machine, then it's the most you, you get the most consistency when everything is made all at one time as opposed to having to move the workpiece around. When I was in a design meeting with our customer, 
as I was going through them, the specifications for the scope, I said, okay, how do you want this thing to mount up? And I said, you want quick detach? You want a quick detach lever? There was silence. All around the table, I had about 10 people sitting at that table. I looked from one guy, I looked to the other, and then a young guy next to me, who was one of the operators, he's like, Bill, they don't hold up. And I said, okay, so what we did, we have a traditional nut and cross bolt, but our cross bolt sits very low down into the Picatinny and clamps very close to the center of that. What we have determined by testing, we have a setup with a load cell. This method produces three times the amount of clamping force than a lever mount, three times. You're just not gonna be able to, with a lever mount, to be able to tighten this up. This type of system, with this one piece scope mount, it doesn't need to be torqued. It's the first thing people say. Well, I have to torque this. You don't have to. You can tighten it up by hand, put a Leatherman in here and a screw, parts right here, sure. tighten it up with a, with a wrench. It stays, it doesn't move, and it's the most secure clamping out there. Guys, I can tell you from experience, I've seen Joe do a lot of random things in the field with this type of stuff, and it's not uncommon to see Rangers or SF or anybody, any military guys, with all kind of nasty mar marks, all of these things where they'll be tightening down everything. But, like you said, if you don't have to have some type of specific specified torque, or if you don't have to require special tools to install it, then that's the beauty of it. That any Joe can just torque it down in the field and it's ready to go, and you don't have to worry about it. I think that people will find that this is the best bound on the market. It has the best return to zero. And as you can see, it's the most beautifully machined scope mount that's out there right now. Looking good, looking good. So you guys, you know, not only from triggers, but to, you know, scope mounts, rail systems, you've got a charging handle. We do. Coming out now. We, we wanted to make a, an ambidextrous charging handle. It's very important. Most people don't grab the weapon and charge it like this. They usually grab it with one hand, okay, whether it's right or left. It's also important to have something for lefties. So what we did is we made an ambidextrous charging handle. It's made out of, again, one solid piece of 7075 T6 aluminum. 7075 was developed by Mitsubishi back in World War II for the Zero Fighter. This is a high strength aluminum. The levers on this charging handle are also machined from Billet 7075. The main thing that's different on ours is it's ergonomic and it's comfortable. Some of these charging handles that's out there, you grab them and they're sharp feel like you need gloves all the time. And I said to myself, what is the most ergonomic charging handle out there? The M1 Grand and the M14. On that charging handle, it has a dual radius, a complex radius. Not only is it curved like this, but it's also curved like that. And that's what we did with this charging handle. It has a complex radius on it, and in that radius there are grooves that enhance your, your, your grip, but it's ergonomic and it's secure at the same time. Yeah, I tell you, you know, it, it's interesting you mentioned that because I do love the M14, M1 uh, Garand, M1 Carbine. It seems like those charging handles do lend themselves really well because you got to think a lot of those charging handles were designed to be used with soldiers not wearing gloves, soldiers who needed to have the manual dexterity of being able to operate those those firearms with a very specific manual of arms to, exactly. to use those guns. Yep. So they needed to have control of what they were working and with. And that's what we've done with our super charging handle. Yeah. I love the, the mounting system for your rails. I've got several of your rails, and uh, I love the way they mount. Tell me how you came up with this mounting system and kind of, you know, what, what led you to come up with this way for free flow. When I first designed our rail, first off, I designed a rail for the HK416. It was the first okay. one we did. But as I looked at the rails out there, many of them used the stock barrel nut. And the stock barrel nut is 11 sixteenths of an inch long bearing surface. It was not designed to support a free floating rail. It seems like people make rails for the stock barrel nut because it's easier to, they don't have to supply one. People are familiar with it, they're familiar with the way that it, that it goes on. So what we decided to do was make a long barrel nut. A rule of thumb in engineering, you can't align long things with short things. This is actually a very complex subject, but if you're going to have a rail that aligns to your barrel and that is secure, you cannot have a little short bearing surface right here. So we extended it out to two and a quarter inches. It's precisely machined to the axis of the rail. It's clamped by two screws and it has two small set screws 
that act as anti-rotation tabs. This is an extremely secure rail. Now I know, uh, Bill, we're getting off on maybe a slightly different vein here, but when you talk about mounting long to short and, and, and like that, and from the engineering aspect that you're discussing there, does that also have to do a lot with barrel harmonics and, and causing any kind of shift in the barrel or odd harmonics with the barrel? Like having that longer sleeve there, does it allow for a stiffer well, one, fit that allows that, that barrel to vibrate in the same way every time? Well, one thing that we found is, is, is that you can now torque your barrel nut. Because this is non-indexing, you don't have to either have under torque or over torque like a stock one. Kind of settling for something. Settling for something. And because of the consistent torque, you can get a barrel nut that is much more secure, aligns itself better, better and the whole system here is, is properly done now instead of being compromised. Okay, so, so definitely more rigid. I guess what I was, exactly. what I was getting at is rigidity. So Very in theory, rigid. having a more rigid upper will in theory translate to a, a more rigid barrel in the big scheme of things. Exactly. I mean, what, whatever the barrel, barrel sitting in is going to have to do with how, it's, how it operates. This becomes much more of a monolithic system at this time without having a monolithic upper and the associated expense and the ex associated non-flexibility of it. Because now you can't change your rail out if something happens. Kind of an oxymoron to some degree, isn't it? You know, it's the least flexible in, in more ways than one. I mean, the monolithic uppers, I know it's kind of one of those things that, at least from my experience, is kind of a snake oil thing where people go, oh, well, yeah, monolithic is one piece. But if, like, from an engineering aspect, if you make the whole system rigid enough, and it's, 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 it comes down to engineering things. So not so much, you know, oh, well, we made it one piece to to make up for some lack of a better thing. Yeah, you have it wasn't to, engineered right to begin with. You have to hit all the design specifications. Right. If you're designing something and you make a list of design specifications, you have to hit every one of them. Many sure. things, once you get into the design, you find out that one thing is missing. And you've already expended a lot of time and a lot of energy in doing it. And I find that many things, and many things that you guys have found that there's one thing that's a problem, they're not willing to go that extra mile. Here at Geisley, we do things the hard way. That's my nature, that's what it's about. Well, show us this Glock here. Uh, I know we've uh, played around with it a time or two here and there, but uh, you mentioned earlier some of the SF guys and other operator types using the flared magwell. You've got the scope mount here, so tell us how this came about. Well, this is an ALG purple. ALG stands for my wife's initials, Amy Lynn Geisley. She's focused for a different part of the market than Geisley is. This mount here is made by Geisley for ALG. Again, it was for a military customer who wanted to not have their optic on the slide. Having the optic on the slide does a couple things. One, it can change the reliability of your gun, all right? You got added mass on here. You're cutting into the slide and making it weaker. But one of the biggest things is, is that during the recoil, you lose the red dot. It moves, and for that microsecond of the slide coming back and going forward, that dot is not there. With this mount, when you shoot, that dot is continually in front of your eyes, and you can tell immediately if you shot a red dot optic that's on the slide, you can, repeat, you can come back to your target much quicker. So it, it would almost be the, the same thing if somebody decided to make a, an optics mount for an M1 Garand charging handle or something, like, you know, an op yeah, rod. You're, you're like, why would you do that? You're putting you know? it on something that moves. Sure. The other benefit of it is, because it makes this area much more rigid, now that when you put, like this Surefire X400, it has a laser on it, Flashlights with lasers on this type of a plastic frame gun are notoriously inaccurate. The, the laser does not retain zero. Now that this is much more rigid, your laser is much more, is, it retains at zero. What do you think the uh, application for something like this could be for like possibly some of the aftermarket uh, metal frames that are out there for Glocks? You think that might add even more rigidity? It very possibly could. We haven't tested on a metal frame, but okay. it's very possible it could. I might be getting a little bit, a little bit further, further out there. Maybe we can test that for you. But uh, sure. I have, I've, I've shot this actual gun and it runs very nice and it's, it's very intuitive to get a hold of. It, it, it points very naturally. Yep. And now ALG Defense. Raven Concealment has made a very nice holster for it, so now there's a whole holster system for it. Awesome. All right, well, Joe's got something else there. Let's, let's see. This right here is our optic mount for the Aimpoint T1, T2, 
We also have a similar mount right here for the Trigicon MRO. Just like our cantilever type optic mount, this is made from a solid billet of 7075 T6 aluminum. You'll notice the extensive machining that's part of this. How all the edges are gracefully machined away, not only to make it comfortable to your hand, but in order to save weight. And you'll notice how everything on that mount is beautifully curved. There's been no compromises to that. It uses a cross bolt that provides 1,400 pounds of force, of clamping force. You'll notice the clamp has a full top angle. Many clamps do not. They have a small sliver up here. That full top, top angle, along with the bottom one, allows that cross bolt to clamp this scope on very securely. Awesome. Uh, another thing we didn't discuss, muzzle devices. Yep. What's your theory on muzzle devices? Well, this muzzle device here, this, this is um, the SCB, single chamber brake. What's interesting about this is that this has a bucket inside. It's not just machined in and there's a, and there's a, and there's a wall in there. This bucket helps to capture the gases and throw the gun forward. It also has compensating ports right here. This muzzle device is light, it's compact, it's extremely effective. It throws a gigantic flame and it's a bit loud. But if you're looking for an effective muzzle brake, that isn't some huge thing hanging out the end of your gun, this is one to look at. I'll tell you one thing I like about it too, and, and you know, may, maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, off on a different vein here, but cost. Uh, they retail the retail on them is very reasonable. It is. Uh, these are fifty-five dollars. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'll tell you what, I know we didn't uh, discuss it in this particular little interview here. Uh, I, I've been learning, I've been get, going to school here, uh, learning a lot from Bill here just in this interview, but uh, your AK trigger, I know. noticed this year you've got an enhanced version. That's right. We shot the initial kind of prototypes this same time last year. Making the trigger for the AK-47 has many challenges. It's a very loosely tolerant gun, it's made by many different people. They make it in many different ways. The parts are very different. The safeties are different. So that any type of a, of a quality type trigger, the safeties don't interface correctly. So making the AKT was, was difficult. But it's a very good trigger and it's at a great price point. It's only $49. Once you try it, I think you'll really like it. It also contains our lightning bow, which is a hybrid curved and hybrid flat. Yeah, it's right there. Hybrid flat bow right here, okay. It's our exclusive lightning bow. So we wanted to make an enhanced one. And we had one last year when we released this. Sure. But it's taken us over a year in order to make the enhanced one right. A lot of people have been waiting for it. For one thing, the AKT Enhanced is hard loop. And that's Geisley's version of, of a type of coating that provides corrosion resistance and wear resistance to the trigger. The trigger here, has a very pleasing gray finish. The hammer and disconnector are black, and you'll find this trigger to be unbelievably light, and it's designed to have a much faster reset than the standard AKT. Oh, I love mine. I mean, I, I don't have the enhanced yet, but even the standard uh, AKTs are great. I've got several. I've got a little PAP SBR from Century that I, I threw one in, and I love it. It's just a great trigger. Yep, and it's a great price point. Oh yeah. Have you found that with those triggers that you've been getting a lot of inquiries from other parts of the world where people are wanting like enhanced triggers in AKs abroad or no. it's just something mainly for the American market? Cause it's for the U.S. Yep. I yeah. think that the um, that American shooters are really turning on to the AK. American shooters know what they want. They 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 understand it. Um, we we honestly have not had many inquiries from overseas on it. Cool. Awesome. Well, is there anything that we, oh, well, Joe's got some oil over here. Okay. Tell, yeah, tell us about right. this. It's like Christmas. I, I'm going to wade here. I'm going to wade into the fire, all right? There's been a lot of controversy out here lately about oils, all right? There's been some oils out there that have been suspected of being straight vegetable oil, canola oil. Joe's over there grinning like a cat that ate the mouse. Well, well <laughs> I used to deal with lubricants. I used to work in the mining industry, and I used to work on... Uh, grinding mills. Lubrication on these machines, some of them are huge, 40, 50 feet in diameter. They take over two years to build and they basically gigantic drums. Think of a four-story building that you're watching it 
and the building just starts to rotate. Rock, huge rocks come in this thing on one end. These machines are filled with something like cannonballs. And as they rotate, the cannonballs come up, they fall, they bash the rock up, they turn the rock into, at the end, a slurry that the gold or the copper could be extracted. Well, wow. these gigantic drums rotate on bearings. Lubrication on these machines is critical. And for the seven years that I was in the mining industry, I learned an awful lot about lubrication. When it comes to guns, it's important to understand the lubrication type that you have. It's called a total loss lubrication system. You don't really see things like that anymore. Back in the day, okay, I'm talking in the beginning of the century, Harley Davidson board track racers had a total loss lubrication system. The oil went into the engine through an oil tank, came out the exhaust pipe. These guys raced around wooden tracks in New Jersey from where I'm from at 90 miles an hour, which back in the early 1900s was an unheard of speed. <laughs> okay? So they raced on wooden tracks with the oil puking out all over this type of thing. A gun is the same type of lubrication system. You put oil on it, the oil flushes dirt away, it lubricates the gun, you have to renew it. What the lubrication industry has moved to is a greener type of lubrication. When I first started in the, in the mining industry back in the mid-1990s, there was a time where many of these large gears on these mining machines started to fail. And what we found was the larger lubricant companies produced an open gear lubricant had recently changed their formula. They stopped putting lead in it. They stopped putting heavy metals in it. And these heavy metals and lead are very effective lubricant. But they also drained out onto the ground in these mines. And because of the push to be green, they took it away and all of a sudden some of these gears started to fail. As we move forward, the lubrication industry has found that vegetable-based oils are the way to go because they're biodegradable. Safe and everything safe. like that. Okay, listen, you're handling this oil. You're working with it. You might eat a sandwich with it on it. If you have an oil that it can possibly hurt you, you won't know it until you're 50 years old and you got cancer, okay? Or, or you try to have kids. <laughs> or you try to have kids, <laughs> yeah. all right? So it's important to have something safe. So these, these, these bio-lubricants have become popular in the lubrication industry. The problem with guns is twofold. One, they're not corrosion resistant. You cannot take your beautifully blue Smith & Wesson Model 27, put this oil on it, and put it away, and expect it to be corrosion free. And two, and this is a kiss of death, they are not stable. They degrade and they lock your gun up. I have guns that I've lubricated with some of these vegetable-based lubes and they are completely locked up. I have an M1 Garand that you can pull that bolt back and it will not go forward in the battery. This is a problem. But there's another advantage of these bio-based oils. Enhanced lubricity. The industry has found, the lubrication industry has found that these, that these bio-based oils are actually more lubricious and slicker than petroleum oils. That's a benefit to it. So what we did is we made this oil right here. It's called Purple Go Juice. This is a sample packet right here. This is purple because of ALG. ALG depends its colors. It's purple. Purple go juice because it's your go-to firearm lubricant. I like the, that. The molecule of this oil, the basis of it is 30% of a GMO oil seed. It's not that there's 30% of that in here. The molecule is 30% of that. GMO, genetically modified organism. You've heard this term where people don't want to eat GMO corn. Or GMO wheat. So a, a seed that is specifically made for lubrication purposes. Specifically made for lubrication purposes. It's a genetically modified oil to be slick. High tech. High tech. So 30% <laughs> of the molecule is this GMO oil seed. Then this molecule is then synthesized and built up to provide the stability and the corrosion resistance that's needed. Now we've done testing on this. One of the main, one of the key key test that I think really is a great test for determining how a lubricant is slick, okay? A lot of people say, I put on my gun, I can feel it's slicker. Felix pin and V-block tester. It's a completely uh, normal test in the lubrication industry. We've done many of these tests on other oils out there. And what we found is the data shows that purple go juice is 250% more lubricious than petroleum-based lubricants. Wow. 
we've done accelerated aging tests to show a concealed carry gun that basically you put in a holster and you let it sit there for several months. This does not gum up and it has very good anti-corrosion properties. We think it's a great, great lubricant. And the other thing, it's not that expensive. Just like all kinds of ALT products, there's great value associated. $11.50 for a big four ounce bottle. Wow. Yeah, and you know, compared to some of the other stuff that's out there, that's a very fair price. Because some of these some of these magic oils that are being sold out there, it seems like they, they charge an awful lot of money for them, you know. It's interesting. Uh, Bill, are you familiar with our meltdown videos we do where we, you know, shoot guns until they fail? I have seen that one on the Air 15, yes. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what we'll probably do. I'm going to try out, we're, we've got many more of those videos planned. I'm going to try some of this stuff out. We'll lubricate the gun and maybe see how well it holds up. And, you know, what about, um, and maybe I'm just a layman here when it comes to lubricants, but what about Flashpoint? Does that matter in any kind of way? Well, I mean, I know that that's something they test just because it's, it's something that can be tested. Okay, so how hot will it get? before it flashes. I mean, that may be irrelevant, but how does that translate to the gun world? Like, why well, does flashpoint matter? Well, in, in lubrication, I'll give you an example. A very high flashpoint oil is oil made by Mobile. It's the very first oil they ever made. That's how the company got started. It's called Mobile Super Cylinder Oil. It's for steam engines. Okay, a steam engine is a total loss lubrication system. All those wheels and all those cranks going back and forth, they have little oil cups on them. And back in the day, you took your oil can and you went over and you lubricated the oil cups at a stop. Then you ran for however far it was, 100 miles. When you stopped, you had to lubricate it again. Sure. Mobile made an oil for the steam engine and for all those pivot points called super cylinder oil. It has an extremely high flash point. Okay. In a gun, it's not that important. You're not getting up into the 400 degree, 500 degree, where it's important that you don't get up that high and then all of a sudden your oil goes poof and bursts into flame. A gun, when it's laying in the desert, in the hot sun, will get to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. That's as hot as it gets. I know that because a railway rail in the desert gets to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. There you go. I know that, okay? <laughs> I don't think it's that important in a gun. What's more important is stability, lubricity, corrosion resistance. So kind of the going distance, like going that distance and how, how it holds up over time. You know, if you're a soldier in the field, you lubricate your firearm, you're going out and, you know, patrol or whatever, and you, you know, been out for three weeks and your gun's still running great, everything's still looking good, the long haul, basically. Exactly. And you want it to be safe. Look, this is, this is a safe lubricant right here. It's bio-based. It has the lowest um, SDS symbol on it, which is an exclamation point, which basically means it's an eye irritant or a skin irritant. It's the lowest one. If you eat this, it'll basically act like a, like a laxative. Yeah, okay, don't drink but it's it. safe. You can get it on your hands, <laughs> and it's no big deal. Yeah, I, I, I would definitely recommend wash your hands, but yeah, it's, it's nice to know. You know, one of the products I use a lot on a regular basis, I'm certainly not, you know, vouching for it by any means, but I use Simple Green a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, when we run our ultrasonics back in the rear, and, you know, I just take water and Simple Green, and I clean a lot of my firearms with Simple Green for that reason, because it's safe. And uh, let's face it, you know, like in our workshop, we got animals passing through. I mean, last thing I need is one of my dogs to go slurp it on the ultrasonic and, you know, have a problem there. But I know we're kind of getting off on a different vein there. Sure. But it's always a pleasure to talk with you, Bill. Same I, here. I know right here, busy. Eric. This is for your, your meltdown test. Awesome. All right. We're going to try it out. All right. Thanks for listening, fellas. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it, Bill. All right. Take care. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, uh, guys, stay tuned. We've got a lot more on the way. Uh, more SHOT Show coverage, more interviews. Um, it's always a pleasure to get to have a chat with Mr. Geisley because he's such a wealth of knowledge. And uh, I, my only wish is I, I wish we could take more time to talk about other things other than just, you know, what we talked about here because I know that there's probably a ton of uh, knowledge in that mind of yours that people would love to hear about. I appreciate that, Eric. Maybe another time. Sure. You got it. Take Thanks. care. Have a good one.